Thank you, Mike. Greetings, uh, welcome one and all to this global congregation gathering together beyond the walls of any single sanctuary. Since we suspended in-person gatherings last March as a part of our response to fighting the novel coronavirus, we have been fortunate to welcome disciples and seekers from 76 different countries around the world. Let me share with you a few more statistics. So far this year, our videos have had 319,700 views on Facebook and YouTube. And we've had over 40,000 engagements this year, which is people commenting or liking or sharing videos. In 2020 alone, people have spent 1,930,500 minutes watching our videos, which is you know, over 32,000 hours. So while we couldn't be pleased, uh, any more pleased with these you know, numbers in their aggregate, we've been so touched directly by those of you around the world who have reached out in comments, in messages, in emails, and even physical letters to share with us testimonies of what this ministry has meant in your life. For, those, for these responses, we have been truly blessed and we thank you. We also uh, want to thank the hundreds of ministers uh, who've participated on screen for sharing their giftedness in these services. You know, we're thankful that this has included uh, current and retired members of the First Presidency, eight of the 12 uh, current apostles so far, uh, and more uh, retired apostles, as well as local leaders from all around the world. Thank you so much for your support. We want to thank the choir, everyone who's been participating in the choir. Uh, and then specifically this week, we want to thank Kathy Baker, Brendan Cartwright, Jerry Dale, John Donald, Julie Edwards, Sandy Gamay, Amelia Goheen, Jenny Jacobson, Glenn Johnson, Judy Luffman, Kelly Mongren, Jackie Mueller, Carla Nilsson, Eric Nilsson, Leandro Palacios, Sharon Solis, David Thatcher, Joel Trinkle, Isabel Williams, David Wilson, Nicola Wood, and Janet Zimmerman. Thank you. We also want to thank everybody whose uh, work makes these services possible. So Leandro for all of his many jobs, for Christian Vago who is doing our French translation, for Parker Johnson and Mary Jean Belrose who are so active on the back end making all of this happen, to Daryl Belrose who served as our Zoom meeting chaplain today, and of course to Mike who is our pianist and helps with all of our audio. So after 21 weeks of continuous programming, our Beyond the Walls team has not had a break. <laughs> However, we are going to take our first ever break uh, beginning tomorrow. Um, as a result, we will not be streaming new lectures or new meditations for the next few weeks. We invite you to discover our vast video archive at centerplace.ca or on our YouTube channel, which is Centerplace TV. Sunday services will continue as scheduled, but for the next two weeks, we will be streaming pre-recorded services um, that will remind us of some of the amazing ministry of, with which we've been blessed. New live stream services will resume Sunday, August 30th, and new lectures and other content will resume September 1st. So we're very blessed today to have ministry in French, in German and in English. Um, as always, the full service is translated and captioned into English, Spanish, and French. So I invite you to read along. If you don't understand these languages, just think of how blessed we are to be having ministry from all over the world. As our ministers grapple with today's theme, God, where are you? I remind you that God's presence has been felt in this community that we share together. As we come together each week, we build sacred community together. Further, we seek to incarnate the living body of Christ as we discern and live out Christ's principles and mission throughout the world. As we prepare for worship today, let us be open to God's illuminating, empowering, and inclusive spirit and now we will go live to Berlin, Germany, 
where our good friend Eva Erickson will offer our call to worship in German. Uh, guten Tag, hello Eva, how are you? Hello John. Unser Aufruf zur Andacht in dieser Woche ist der Beginn der Geschichte von Jakob und seinen Söhnen aus dem 37. Kapitel des ersten Buch Mose, Verse 2 bis 4. Dies ist die Geschichte Jakobs. Josef war 17 Jahre alt, als er mit seinen Brüdern das Vieh hütete. Und er war als Knabe bei den Söhnen Bilhas und Silpas, den Frauen seines Vaters. Und Josef brachte vor ihren Vater, was man ihnen Schlimmes nachsagte. Israel aber hatte Josef lieber als alle seine Söhne, weil er ihn in seinem Alter bekommen hatte. Und er hatte ihm einen bunten Leibrock machen lassen. Als nun seine Brüder sahen, dass ihr Vater ihn lieber hatte als alle seine Brüder, hassten sie ihn und wollten nicht mehr in Frieden mit ihm reden. Danke, Eva. And now I invite you all to sing along as our Beyond the Walls choir sings number, uh, hymn number 94, uh, God, The God of Abraham Praise. Actually, the lyrics are by Maimonides, which is a medieval Jewish theologian. We now go to 
Puyallup, uh, I always say this wrong, <laughs> Puyallup, Washington, uh, where our, our dear friend Jennifer Redburn will offer the invocation. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, and good morning. Will you pray with me? Creator God, faithful God, we humbly come before you to give you honor and praise. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together from around the world in common purpose as sacred community. You are the source of all that is good, of all our blessings. We thank you for the many gifts you have given us. As we gather here in this moment from around the world, may we be fully aware of your presence here with each of us connected across the vast ethernet. Our world is full of disruptions and distractions, diseases, wars, political battles, the roar of demands on our time, our emotions, our monies, and our energy. In this roar, Lord, are other voices crying out for help, singing your praises or sending words of encouragement. Lord, may we pause, take a break from our daily activities to seek you, to open our ears, hear your voice, and invite you into our hearts. We recognize your strength and your love. May the sacred community of voices rise above the roar of distraction, strengthened in our obedience to you. May our voices join with yours to become a strong tide across the waters, drawing us together into a mighty force for peace, justice, and healing of this earth clearing the way for your kingdom, the peaceable kingdom, to continue to be a reality for all who desire to follow and serve you. May your spirit be with Roger this morning as he delivers your message. And may all present here today and in the days to come have the opportunity to hear the word, your word. Let us not only hear you, dear Lord, may we also be awakened transformed, become fully alive, willing to risk and step into the unknown to invite others to respond to the call to follow the peaceful one and embody shalom. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. And now we go live to Tahiti in French Polynesia, where Apostle Mareva Arnaud will give our peace lesson. Bonjour, Mareva. Bonjour, John. Jusqu'où? Jusqu'à quand? Je n'en peux plus, c'est trop dur. Mais où es-tu, Dieu? Où es-tu, Dieu? Est le thème d'aujourd'hui. Je pense que dans ce temps de pandémie et ses conséquences bouleversent encore nos vies, où la double explosion dans le port de Beyrouth a emporté ville entière avec elle des précieuses vies et changé à jamais tout un peuple, où les Ouïghours, ethnie musulmane en Chine, sont installés dans des camps et bien d'autres situations encore. Nous comprenons ces interrogations. Pour beaucoup, le confinement est une bénédiction. Entouré de leur famille, retour aux bases de la vie ensemble, se réunir, faire une pause, déstresser, s'occuper aux travaux de la maison. Pour d'autres, cependant, le confinement a été comme une prison dorée, où elles ou ils se retrouvent avec leur seule pensée, sans espace, sans visite, ni personne avec qui il est partagé. Une définition de l'isolement est le constat d'une situation dans laquelle un individu est séparé de gré ou de force du reste de son environnement habituel. Dans certaines formes d'isolement involontaire où les relations sociales sont amoindries ou perdues, les personnes éprouvent la plupart du temps 
un sentiment de souffrance et de solitude profonde et lourde. Cette solitude est associée à des risques accrus de difficultés de santé physique et mentale, entraînant une dépression ou un suicide, tant cette situation est intense et très douloureuse. L'isolement est trop dur. Je ne supporte plus le confinement. Je ne tenais plus. Ces mots sont ceux d'une patiente qui s'est présentée cette semaine même aux urgences avec des idées suicidaires. Et elle n'est pas la seule. Fin mars, alors que la crise s'étend en Allemagne, le ministre des Finances allemand s'est suicidé. Il s'était dit profondément inquiet des répercussions économiques de la crise sanitaire. Début avril, c'est le médecin du club de foot du stade de Reims qui s'est suicidé en apprenant qu'il était détecté positif et se trouvait en quarantaine chez lui. Un afflux de patients épuisés, désorientés, des tentatives de suicide qui explosent à Lille, en France. L'impact du coronavirus sur la santé mentale se fait durement sentir. Des dispositifs qui étaient déjà en place sont bandés et ballottés entre des malades du COVID-19, une personne en grand besoin psychologique et tous les autres dans le besoin médical. En juin, pendant le confinement à Tahiti, un ami s'est donné la mort, laissant famille, brisé, ne pouvant pas faire un deuil de manière convenable et complète. Et ce ne sont que quelques témoignages parmi tant d'autres. Est-ce que la pandémie de COVID-19 s'accompagnera d'une épidémie de suicide due à la solitude? C'est la crainte que nombreux médecins, services sociaux et familiaux ont exprimé et publié. Tout dépend du type de crise que nous traversons et de l'impact sur notre environnement. Certaines crises font baisser le taux de suicide. Les périodes de guerre, par exemple, ont souvent un effet protecteur à ce niveau-là dans la population générale. Ainsi, selon une étude, durant les trois mois qui ont suivi le 11 septembre, le taux de suicide a diminué significativement à New York. Durkheim avait déjà souligné le rapport entre l'impact des événements sur le lien social et le nombre de suicides. Et selon les études, l'attentat a augmenté la cohésion sociale parmi les habitants de New York, notamment à travers le fort soutien envers ceux qui ont nettoyé Ground Zero et les volontaires civils. Le sentiment d'appartenance qui mobilise une nation serait un élément protecteur. C'est le même mécanisme qui a été constaté en France lors de la victoire de la Coupe du Monde en 1998, avec une baisse du taux de suicide de 10,3 le mois suivant la victoire française. L'effet était immédiat. Le lendemain de chaque match, on retrouvait une forte diminution par rapport au taux attendu. Ici encore, la cohésion de groupe entre en jeu. Le risque suicidaire est majoré de 20 à 30 en cas de chômage. Or, des dizaines de millions de personnes risquent de perdre leur emploi à cause du COVID-19. « You will never walk alone. Vous ne marcherez jamais seul », chantent les supporters de Liverpool. Mais qu'en est-il aujourd'hui ?« L'homme est un animal social », disait Aristote. Y aura-t-il ici aussi une cohésion sociale assez forte, un soutien comme on peut le voir avec le soutien adressé au personnel soignant de la, par la population générale? À l'heure où encore une grande partie de l'humanité est confinée, l'isolement reste l'un des facteurs majeurs pouvant entraîner la dépression et la mort. Dieu, où es-tu? Je suis une vie qui veut vivre au milieu de vie qui veulent vivre. Ces quelques mots formulés il y a de cela un siècle par Albert Schweitzer est en accord avec les principes de la communauté du Christ, invitant le respect et l'amour de toute forme de vie, humaine, végétale, animale, 
une éthique supranationale et supraconfessionnelle respectant les hommes sans distinction d'origine. Mais pour que la vie puisse vivre avec sérénité et égalité, il est essentiel d'allier la raison et le cœur, de parler en théorie, mais surtout d'agir avec des actions concrètes. Et d'autant plus aujourd'hui, où toutes les vies sont bafouées, d'agir avec une égale compassion pour tous aux quatre coins du monde. L'éthique ne peut être élaborée que si elle commence par l'individu. Là est la source du pouvoir qui, s'unissant au groupe, communauté et au monde, transforme la société. La foi en ce pouvoir est essentielle pour la paix. Guidée et motivée par les paroles de la doctrine et alliance, section 161.3a. Ouvrez vos cœurs et sentez les ardentes aspirations de vos frères et sœurs qui sont seuls, méprisés, effrayés, négligés et sans amour. Allez vers eux avec compréhension, serrez leurs mains et invitez-les tous à partager les bénédictions de la communauté qui fut créée au nom de celui qui souffrit pour nous tous. La communauté du Christ, à travers les évangélistes et les instructeurs, offre une écoute active et attentive pour toute personne dans le besoin. Dans l'un des centres de mission, nombreux évangélistes sont sollicités par des couples, des amis, des familles, pour des conversations par téléphone ou via les réseaux sociaux. Je suis si heureuse qu'amis, membres, souvent des inconnus, sachent qu'ils peuvent se tourner et se confier à un évangéliste. Des congrégations se sont organisées pour choisir des membres qui, par le biais des moyens de communication actuels, se portent volontaires pour contacter régulièrement les familles éloignées, les personnes seules et prendre de leurs nouvelles. Et depuis le confinement à ce jour, le ministère en ligne offert par la communauté du Christ est devenu un renforcement, un lien important pour tant de personnes. Ce ministère apporte une lumière qui éclaire le foyer, mais surtout leur cœur, spécialement pour tant de personnes isolées ou éloignées. La communauté du Christ partage le sacrement de la communion en ligne. Cette action invite et touche toutes les personnes à communier et vivre ce moment intime avec le Christ entouré et au milieu d'une famille de foi. Ce moyen offre ce sentiment d'appartenance et d'amour qui mobilise, qui unit et protège. Et si nous nous concentrons dans nos groupes et congrégations sur le sujet de l'isolement et du suicide, nous pourrons vivre la poursuite de la paix et approfondir notre engagement pour affirmer la bénédiction de la communauté, nous engager dans des partenariats avec des associations qui luttent contre le suicide ainsi apprendre et être dans le cœur des vies, être entièrement présent comme Jésus le fut pour ceux dans le besoin, pour nous. Personne même entouré ne devrait se sentir seul ou abandonné par la majorité. Pour la majorité, nous ne sommes pas médecins ni psychologues de profession, mais nous sommes empreints de l'amour du Christ qui enlaçant la personne seule, celle qui cherche et celle qui souffre. Dans la doctrine et alliance en 62 cc nous sommes rappelés que nous tenons des vies précieuses entre nos mains. Soyons doux et gracieux envers les uns et les autres. Une communauté n'est pas plus forte que le plus faible de ses membres, de même que celui que nous suivons est allé vers ceux qui étaient rejetés et en marge de la société. Ainsi doit agir la communauté qui porte son nom. Aujourd'hui, j'allume une bougie pour la prière, pour la paix quotidienne. Et à l'unisson, prions pour que nous, nous puissions nous souvenir de ce, tous ceux qui ont perdu un être cher, ceux qui se sentent seuls et tous qui œuvrent pour la paix. Prions. Dieu de la guérison et de l'unité, nous reconnaissons et honorons la vie que tu offres avec tant d'amour. Nous faisons cette pause et prions pour que tu investisses toutes les personnes de ton assurance et de ton espoir. S'il te plaît, à ceux qui sont seuls, qui cherchent une ouverture vers la lumière. Merci de mettre sur leur chemin des étoiles qui leur apporteront l'attention et répondre à leurs besoins. Que celui ou celle qui est seul sente ta douce présence dans son cœur, qu'il voit ton amour exprimé dans chaque souffle, chaque pas pris et dans chaque voix ou rencontre. Fais que tous se sentent appartenir à ton plan, que tous trouvent la paix dans l'unité et l'amour d'une famille. Amen. Merci, Mareva. 
God, where are you? Dios, ¿dónde estás? Dieu, ¿où es tu? Muchas veces sentimos la necesidad de hacer esta pregunta. Y sin embargo, muchas veces se nos recuerda que Dios está ahí, con nosotros, a nuestro alrededor. Souvent, on nous rappelle que tout ce que nous avons à faire est d'ouvrir notre esprit et notre cœur et de laisser entrer l'amour et la grâce de Dieu. God is right there with you today, wherever you are. So please let us know where God is today, writing your location in the chat box. So let's see. Let's take a look at Facebook and you too to see where God is today. If you haven't done it, please let us know where God is. So we have um, God is today in Iowa City with Mary Grace Allred uh, sharing on YouTube. We have also, let's see where God is on, on Facebook. We have God in, oops, God is with the Franks in Oak Grove on Missouri. So thank you, Heather, for sharing that. I thank you for clicking like and, and sharing this video. Les agradezco por darle clic en me gusta y por compartir este video. Venez cliquer sur j'aime et partager cette vidéo. With just one click, you do in mission, helping us draw the circle wide, inviting everyone into this community. And for that, as always, I thank you. Por eso, muchas gracias. Et pour cela, merci. Thank you, Leandro. Thank you, Mike. And now we go live to Montreal, Quebec, where our friend Christian Vago will offer our disciples generous response. Bonjour, Christian. Bonjour à tous. Bonjour, uh, Apôtre Mareva. Bonjour, John. J'espère que vous allez tous bien. Ça me fait plaisir de vous retrouver chaque semaine pour aborder la question des dîmes et des offrandes. J'ose espérer que c'est bien le Saint-Esprit qui m'a inspiré à proposer une analogie entre un aspect du fonctionnement de nos finances et la mer morte. Je conçois totalement que parler de la mer morte pour expliquer le fonctionnement de nos finances n'est pas à prime abord la façon la plus positive d'aborder cette question. Je ne pense pas que j'apprécierais moi-même que quelqu'un vienne me dire « Eh oh !» Christian, tes finances sont comme la mer morte. Avant de développer ma pensée sur le sujet, permettez-moi une parenthèse pour vous expliquer mon arrière-plan. En 34 ans de vie chrétienne, je pense avoir presque tout entendu sur la question des finances personnelles, des dîmes et des offrandes. Certaines choses ont été édifiantes et d'autres beaucoup moins. Par exemple, il m'est arrivé d'évoluer dans un milieu où le nom de Jésus-Christ était écrit partout, euh, confessé à la, à, à la fin de chaque respiration presque, comme pour ponctuer des phrases. Mais lorsqu'il était question de la dîme, celle-ci nous était présentée comme indispensable au salut. Tu ne peux pas être sauvé ou du moins tu ne peux pas être exalté si tu ne payes pas ta dîme, et j'ai entendu à se demander si le salut dépendait de mes œuvres, particulièrement de ma dîme, ou s'il dépend de l'œuvre de Jésus-Christ. Et si c'est en Jésus-Christ que se trouve vraiment toute la plénitude de la divinité, l'exaltation, comme a écrit Paul dans Colossiens 2,9, ou non. Or, soit l'Écriture dit la vérité, soit elle ment. Et aussi faut-il s'entendre sur ce qu'est la dîme, et ce qu'elle n'est pas. 
Mille fois aussi, j'ai vu, comme vous peut-être, Malachie 3.10. Vous savez le passage qui dit « Mettez-moi ainsi à l'épreuve, dit l'Éternel, le maître de l'univers, et vous verrez si je n'ouvre pas pour vous les écluses, les fenêtres du ciel, si je ne déverse pas sur vous la bénédiction en abondance. » Il m'est arrivé d'aller parler à un pasteur, voyant une dérive dans son église au fil des années, dans l'utilisation de ce passage, qui était devenu une véritable arme de manipulation massive contre les plus pauvres. Je lui demandais, car qui a le plus besoin que Dieu ouvre les écluses des cieux Le riche ou le pauvre C'est facile de mettre 1000 dollars sur la table pour Dieu quand j'en gagne 10 000. C'est une toute autre histoire d'en mettre 60 quand j'en gagne 600. Dans cette église, dix ans plus tard, les pauvres étaient toujours plus pauvres. Alors, pour les encourager à continuer de donner, on en était venu à leur expliquer que oui, ils avaient été fidèles dans les dîmes, que oui, Dieu avait bien ouvert les écluses des cieux, mais que, je cite, « un filet empêche les richesses de tomber » et que ce filet, c'était leur péché. Bref, une histoire sans fin. Dans la communauté du Christ, pour éviter ces dérives, nous parlons d'une dîme, comme celle d'Abraham, sur son butin, ainsi qu'on peut le lire dans Hébreu 7, verset 4, qui est sur l'augmentation des richesses. Ainsi d'ailleurs que cela avait bien été révélé au début de la restauration de l'Église au XIXe siècle. Dans l'Église primitive aussi, il y avait un principe d'égalité qui était celui-ci. Le riche était appelé à mettre, en plus de sa dîme, une partie de ce que le pauvre n'arrivait pas à donner. On retrouve ce principe dans 2 Corinthiens 8. Le chapitre entier en parle. J'en arrive à la mer morte. La mer morte, qui est un lac en réalité, doit son nom au fait qu'elle garde pour elle-même la totalité du sel apporté par le Jourdain. On estime que le Jourdain lui apporte environ 850 000 tonnes de sel par an. Et la mer morte ne redistribue rien de tout ça plus loin. Résultat, bien que le sel ait certaines vertus, il est une richesse, le fait que la mer morte retienne ce sel en totalité empêche toute vie dans ses eaux et que si baigner plus de dix minutes peut même être dangereux pour la santé. La mer morte nous donne l'exemple d'un principe biologique, scientifique. Tu gardes tout ton sel pour toi-même, la vie n'est pas possible. Et j'ai la conviction que ce principe est aussi un principe spirituel. La veuve de Sarepta, dont un élément biographique nous est rapporté dans 1 Roi 17, nous donne l'exemple d'une femme qui a choisi de mettre en mouvement un flux de farine et d'huile. Cette veuve n'était certainement pas pauvre d'ailleurs, mais elle était veuve, ce qui à l'époque pouvait fragiliser la position d'une femme de n'importe quel statut social. En créant un mouvement dans sa maigre réserve d'huile et de farine, ces deux éléments n'allaient plus cesser de croître chez elle au point qu'elle put même payer ses dettes en apportant des jarres d'huile à ses créanciers. Notons qu'à l'époque, l'huile était une preuve de richesse. Le résultat de ce mouvement lui a même évité que son fils lui soit enlevé et emmené comme esclave. La pauvre veuve de Marc 12, versets 41 à 44, elle aussi a créé un flux en déposant une petite pièce dans le tronc du temple. Un mouvement, un petit ruisselet, en apparence, mais un fleuve immense dans ses très maigres finances à elle. On ne sait pas ce que ce mouvement aura donné dans sa vie. Toutefois, connaissant Jésus, je ne peux pas croire qu'un miracle ne s'est pas produit dans la vie de cette femme, car il y avait non loin d'elle bien plus grand, bien davantage que le prophète Élie de la veuve de Sarepta. Alors, je nous donne un défi. Ça va être bien plus excitant que le Ice Bucket Challenge 
hein, ce qui consiste à se renverser un seau d'eau glacé sur la tête. Et si nous provoquions un mouvement dans la partie stagnante de nos finances Venez ensuite inscrire un commentaire dans le fil Facebook ou YouTube dans quelques semaines ou quelques mois, pas dans quelques années, pour nous dire ce que vous avez retiré de cette initiative. Créez un mouvement dans la partie stagnante de vos finances. Que ce soit en termes de satisfaction personnelle, vous en aurez peut-être retiré quelque chose, de sentiments positifs, d'accomplissement ou même qui sait de renouveau dans vos finances. S'il vous plaît, priez avec moi. Notre Père qui es aux cieux, que ton nom soit sanctifié, que ton règne vienne. Nous te remettons humblement une partie de ce que tu nous as permis d'acquérir. Fais que ce soit utilisé avec sagesse et respect, dans une vraie crainte de ton nom. Vois les besoins et les désirs de chacun, chacune, qui s'apprête à créer un mouvement dans ses finances. Prends soin de celles et ceux qui sont dans le besoin. Calme le cœur et les craintes de celles et ceux qui vivent des turbulences dans leurs emplois. Fais-nous grâce, Père. Pas à cause de nos œuvres, mais à cause des mérites de Jésus, ton Fils, au nom duquel nous te prions. Amen. Amen. I never took the ice bucket challenge, but I challenge you all to take this one. This is going to be our challenge to you. Thank you, Christian. And now we go back to Tahiti, where Puna Tenio is going to do our lectionary reading in French. Welcome, Puna. Bonjour. Israël lui dit, Israël dit à Joseph, « Tes frères ne font-ils pas paître le troupeau à Syrie? Viens, je veux t'envoyer vers eux. » Et il répondit, « Me voici. » Israël lui dit, « Va, je te prie, et vois si tes frères sont en bonne santé et si le troupeau est en bon état, et tu m'en rapporteras des nouvelles. » Il envoya ainsi, de la vallée des Blancs. Et Joseph alla à Syrie. Un homme le rencontra. Comme il errait dans les champs, il le questionna en disant, « Que cherches-tu » Joseph répondit, « Je cherche mes frères. Dis-moi, je te prie, où ils font paître leur troupeau. » Et l'homme dit, ils sont partis d'ici car je les ai entendus dire « Allons à Dothan. » Joseph alla après ses frères et il les trouva à Dothan. Ils le virent de loin et avant qu'il fît près d'eux, ils complotèrent de le faire mourir. Ils se dirent l'un à l'autre « Voici le faiseur de songes qui arrive. Venez maintenant, tuons-le. » Et jetons-le dans une décité. Nous dirons qu'une bête féroce l'a dévoré et nous verrons ce que deviendra. Ses songes. Ruben entendit cela et le délivra de leur main. Il dit Ne lui autant pas l'argent. Ruben leur dit Ne répondez point de sang. Jetez-le dans cette cité qui est au désert et ne mettez pas la main sur il avait dessein de le délivrer de leur mère pour le faire retourner vers son père. Lorsque Joseph fut arrivé auprès de ses frères, il le dépouillait de sa tunique, de la tunique de plusieurs couleurs qu'il avait sur lui. Il le prit et le jetait dans la citerne. Cette citerne était vide, il n'y avait point d'eau. Au passage des marchands madianites, ils tirèrent et firent remonter Joseph hors de la cité et le vendirent pour 20 cycles d'argent aux Ismaélites qui l'emmènent en Égypte. Merci. And now 
we will go live to Whitby, Ontario, where our own Roger Dotson is here to deliver our message. Welcome, Roger. So wonderful to see you. Uh, good day, John, and hola, bonjour, and good morgen. <laughs> it's good being here worshiping with everyone today. Now that we're getting back to some form of normalcy, we see those now getting back to the golf course to play golf. And one of the questions asked, is there golf in heaven? And Bill was out golfing with his friend one day, and they wanted to know if there was golfing in heaven. They made an agreement that if one should go before the other, they would come back and let the other know because of the love of the game. They just could not imagine no golfing in heaven. His friend passed away and never came back to let Bill know if there was or wasn't golf in heaven. Finally, one day his friend appeared. Bill thought that his friend never made it to heaven. Bill asked him if there was golf in heaven. He said that he had good news and he had bad news. What would you like first, the good news or the bad news? Bill said, what could be the bad news if there's golfing in heaven? The good news is that there is indeed golfing in heaven. So Bill asked then, what is the bad news? Your tea time is tomorrow at 9 a.m. <laughs> the theme for today is God, where are you? In the scripture reading, which was just read by Puna, this is what Joseph must have been thinking. Why is this being allowed to happen to me? God, where are you? Joseph is hated by his brothers and he is sold into slavery. His father, Israel, loved him more than all of his children. It says because he was the son of his old age and then he made Joseph a tunic of many colors. When his brothers saw that his father loved him more than all of them, they hated him, and it says that they could not speak peaceably to him. Joseph, only being 17 years of age, when he was sold into slavery for 20 pieces of silver. This being one of the remarkable life stories of the Bible. The question, God, where are you? Now this could be asked by the following men that had faith in the Bible. Enoch shows the walk of faith. Noah shows the perseverance of faith. Abraham shows the obedience of faith. Isaac shows the power of faith. Jacob shows the discipline of faith. Along these lines, we could say that Joseph shows the triumph of faith. Joseph threw out all of this never complained and never compromised. Joseph was loved and hated, favored and abused, trusted and exalted, and abased. Yet at no time in the 110 year life of Joseph did he ever seem to take his eyes off of God or cease to trust him. Adversity did not harden his character. Prosperity did not ruin him. He was the same in private as he was in public. He was truly a great man. Through all of this, God did not depart from Joseph. At times in life, we may be discouraged by what is happening in our life. We may sometimes begin to question if God is really here, and is he really active? There was a minor prophet who was active around 612 BC, which is only three chapters in the Bible. And that prophet was Habakkuk. I'd like to share a bit of background information. Who is Habakkuk? His name meant to embrace, and embrace is what he did. Habakkuk had a deep love for God, and for God's people. The message Habakkuk was to deliver to his fellow countrymen 
was the message of return to God. He had a problems with their dedication. They were on again, off again, followers of God. And Habakkuk had enough. No one was responding to the message. No one was changing. Habakkuk's first complaint was, it seemed to him that God was not answering his prayers to the wickedness and injustice around him. Then he decided to make a covenant with the Lord and made sure that the people would follow the commandments for the rest of his life as king. This was Habakkuk's complaint. God, where are you? And we find this in the book of Habakkuk, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. And in verse 2, it says, How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is slack. And judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth come pass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. You can feel the pain and anguish when he cries out, How long, Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. And tells us in the book of Psalms 46, verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Let him share your burdens and reveal his purpose for you. So often we hear those who question the existence of God. And there's a story entitled, Does God Exist? A man went into a barber shop to get his hair cut and his beard trimmed as he often did. And as the barber began to work, he began to have a good conversation. He talked about many things and various subjects. When they eventually touched on the subject of God, the barber said, I don't believe that God exists. And why do you say that, asked the customer. Well, you just have to go out in the street and realize that God doesn't exist. Tell me, if God exists, would there be so many sick people? Would there be abandoned children? If God existed, there would be neither suffering or pain. I can't imagine a loving God that would allow all these things. The customer thought for a moment, but didn't respond because he didn't want to start an argument. The barber finished his job and the customer left the shop. Just as he left the barber shop, he saw a man in the street with long, stringy, dirty hair and an untrimmed beard. He looked dirty and unkempt. The customer turned back and entered the barber shop again and said to the barber, you know what? Barbers don't exist. How can you say that? Asked the surprised barber. I'm here and I'm a barber and I just worked on you. No, the customer exclaimed. Barbers don't exist because if they did, there would be no people with dirty long hair and untrimmed beards, just like the man outside. Oh, but barbers do exist. That is what happens when people don't come to me. Exactly, affirmed the customer. That's the point. God too does exist. That is what happens when people do not go to him and look to him for help. That is why there is so much suffering in the world. There needs to be an awakening in our present time. A house divided against itself cannot stand. On June 16, 1858, Abraham Lincoln spoke those words to his Republican colleagues in Springfield, Illinois State House. He had just been chosen to run against Stephen Douglas for United States Senate. 
when Lincoln's law partner, William Herden, questioned the use of a strong statement, the future president said, the proposition is indisputably true and I will deliver it as written. I want to use some universally known figure expressed in simple language as universally known that it may strike home to the minds of men in order to arouse them to the perils of the times. Lincoln's famous statement is a paraphrase of Jesus' word, which is found in Mark 3, 25. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Lincoln was right because the Lord is always right. Unity is the foundation of everything that we value. Peace and love, respect and purpose. And like Lincoln's colleague, we need to be reminded of what's crucial to awaken us to the peril of the times. Lincoln ended his impassioned plea for the abolition of slavery with these famous words. The result is not doubtful. We shall not fail. If we stand firm, we shall not fail. Wise counsel may accelerate or mistakes delay it, but sooner or later, the victory is sure to come. If we stand firm to the true, to the callings and teachings of Christ, we shall not fail. When you wake up in the morning, do you work, start your day by saying, good morning, God? Or do we start a day by saying, good God, morning? Do we start the day by saying, this is the day that the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. When we have hurts and trials and tribulations in our life, and sometimes we feel overwhelmed. There's a place in the Bible that will provide assurance and comfort for you. And I like to share in the reading of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want anything but my shepherd. He is strong and wise and wonderful. He loves me, although he knows my faults and even the sin of selfishness that beset me. He loves me for what I am. And when I'm tired and weary, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures in that lush, soft grass. I rest and he stands guard over my thoughts so no disturbing one enters in. I'll let go of my burdens and cares. I am still and know that he is God. And when I'm rested and refreshed, ready to start my earthly journey again, he leadeth me beside still waters. I sit there in the quiet of the evening and see the sun sink behind the mountains. In the golden hour, my heart finds peace. My striving ceases and I surrender to his will. He restoreth my soul. Yes, he takes my hand and holds it fast while we walk past the many forks in the road. How easily I could have chosen the wrong one as he had not been with me. But he leads me in a path of righteousness for his name's sake. It is a narrow path, but also beautiful. The birds sing in the early morning while the grass is wet with dew, the sun shines and the air is fresh and pure. If I let go of my shepherd's hand and wander off and get lost in the deep forest of the wilderness, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. He will seek me until he finds me. And when I grow weary and faint and falter, because fear chokes me, and my vision fails me as the shadows grow deeper and darker. Then I remember, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. 
they protect me from all ills. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies, whose names are fear, selfishness, and insecurity. And when they see me drink of gladness and joy and eat of the perfect peace, they lead me and then thou anointest my head with oil. The gentleness of his hand almost makes my heart burst asunder with happiness in which my cup runneth over. It is too full. I have for no more. There's no limit to the abundance of gifts which the good shepherd bestows on me. His gifts are from the best of the land. So I shall never be lonely. He gives me companions. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And as we walk together along one day at dusk, I shall come to the bend in the road. I shall stop. And far off in the distance, I shall see a mansion. It is a house not made of hands, eternal in the heavens, and only the single eye of the soul can behold it. I shall bow down and worship, and as I walk silently towards it, my heart leaps with their laughter and it echoes back through God's heaven into a jelly chorus of the saints. I have forgotten my yesterdays and my many tomorrows, because I shall enter and dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Let us be reminded of the words of the psalmist who said, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts in wisdom, to see each day as an opportunity for spiritual growth and expression and to practice and to develop relationships, to discern the internal nature of time, investing in unselfishness and giving of ourselves for others. When we call out, God, where are you? Let us be reminded of the words of the psalmist in Psalm 61, 46, 1. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Take time to listen. Let him share your burdens and reveal his purpose for you. May God add his blessing as we strive to do his will is my prayer for you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Roger. And now um, I invite you to join with the Beyond the Walls Choir for our closing hymn, Number 208, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord.
Thanks again to the Beyond the Walls Choir for that lovely rendition. And then we'll need to get the slides back. All right. And for our sending forth, as you go forth seeking God, remember the experience of the prophet Elijah, who was told to go and stand upon a mountain where God would reveal himself. As we read in 1 Kings 19, now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. God is not limited by our expectations, but God is with us always. God be with you all. Amen. Thanks to everyone. I invite you to stay on with us after uh, Mike's postlude. I'll be chatting with all of our ministers and checking in how they're doing. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, the blessing of your ministry. And John, I see you already uh, at your chair. 
So thank you so much, everyone. I think I might have both my microphones on. Oh, I know what's happening. There you go. Now we can okay. hear you. <laughs> Very good. Oh, thank you, everyone. What a wonderful, amazing service. I'm, as a person who is kind of a, a poor monoglot, I'm always I'm still enriched by being able to, um, anyway, when we're having our services in different languages from around the world. And so I so much appreciate uh, this experience and your sharing with us. Um, I guess I wanted to uh, just check in with each of you and see um, how things are going and whether in the midst of, for example, of uh, this pandemic that we're having, we're about to take a little bit of a break and do a vacation, but it's a little unlike what we normally do. Normally we'll go to, to Europe or somewhere and spend two weeks and, and really try to get to know a place. Uh, we can't go anywhere. <laughs> so we're gonna get to know our own, our own backyard is what we're gonna try to do. Um, and so uh, I guess I was gonna ask, uh, let's all ask Ava. Um, how, I know things are doing going better in Germany than they were before, but it, does that is there possibilities for vacations and things like that, or no yet? Well, we went on vacation, so I guess yeah. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> but I mean, uh, mostly in Germany. I visited in Germany, but you can travel within Europe. You just have to be careful with some areas like Spain and Bulgaria, a little bit off limits, but. For the most part, I think they were really worried about the tourism industry, and so they tried to open up things again. So very good. Where did you go on your vacation? Not very far from here. The closest mountains to here are called the Hartz Mountains, and so it was. It's a very historical area. It was lovely to be there. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I saw uh, Christian. Thank you so much for for sharing with us the disciples' generous response and also your experience. Um, I saw uh, one of your daughters there. Have what is the what are the plans in Montreal for for school and things? Okay, good question. Uh, we don't know, and they don't know. So we are. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> we are uh, preparing everything. We bought everything we need for uh, back to school, but uh, still we have no idea. Uh, supposed to be okay. We uh, our kids supposed to go to school again. Uh, after the vacations, but uh, surprises are always possible. So we'll see in a couple of weeks. Yeah, it's amazing. I um, mean, well, there's no, not much of a playbook on any of this and everybody's going, doing as they can, but it's hard, especially for parents to be planning in these times with so much uncertainty. Yeah, absolutely. We don't know if, okay, will we have to, to, to give school at home? Yeah. Um, if, okay, how? Do we do uh, with the jobs? Exactly. So, we'll see. Or we take our kids to the jobs. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> it's uh, wow. for now. It's like a joke, and we'll see if, when we will face the thing in a few weeks. But um, my feeling is the school will be there, and um, at least for uh, the young kids. Maybe not for. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Be there. Hello, Jen. Hello. So for, um, for the older kids, uh, but for the youngest, probably the school will be open. Ah, very good. Well, and Roger, I know that you already took your your kind of in in province vacation, and yeah. so uh, you were able to, I think, visit actually Mary Jean and Daryl, <laughs> so, so, who 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 always live in a beautiful place. Yeah, lovely country up there. Yeah, it was nice being able to get, share with them. And I, I, I look forward to this Sunday all the time, being able to be with everybody from different places around the world. I think it's uh, wonderful that we can all bring a, a different ministry to each other and being able to touch each other. And uh, what I find very uh, heartwarming, I met so many new friends and people I never knew before. So th I think this is this is wonderful in itself. Yeah, absolutely. And and um, what was I just thinking of? Oh, and one of the things you were, I know how much you you know like you were very tied in into the service all the time. And so one of the things when you were on your trip, you had no internet, so no. so you could so you actually have some reruns that you get to watch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I always 
look forward to when this service is over to go back and see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's wonderful. So it's uh, fantastic. And, and Parker, we, we I don't know if we checked in with you about it, but you guys also went on trips and you had to, you were originally going to try to get all the way up to the Arctic, but the territories in Canada don't let um, disease-ridden provincials like us into their territory. <laughs> so. I, I'm sorry, Parker. I don't know why your microphone is not working. And is it? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll check with you next time. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> you can t you can type it in. I'll read it for you, Parker. Yeah. And um, we're great to great to see Jennifer back with us. We had you here just a little while ago, and you were, I think, telling us about how things were going in the in terms of politics and stuff, and in the in the Pacific Northwest in the United States. Um, but what is the situation like in terms of, I mean, things like schools and things as people are approaching that? Oh, yes. Uh, for the most part, of course, we backslid and the numbers went up. And so um, everything is pretty much shut back down again. Most of the schools will be doing online. Um, there's a couple, it depends on the county. Uh, in a few counties where the COVID numbers are low, they will probably be doing part-time in-person school. But in the area where I live, just south of Seattle and in, and in Seattle, right now the plan is online only, mm. um, which you know, I guess it's better than nothing, but, but um, the children are losing a lot of valuable social skills. It's, it's hard to even imagine, like, I mean, if you just look back on your, you know, how important each grade was in your, right. in your memory and, and how actually how long that is in a child's lifetime, um, this idea of having this lost year or whatever is going to be a very strange and, and part of this thing that brings this Generation Z all together, I think, when they look back. So this is going to be right. a, a unique experience. Right. This is actually something that I, I pray about daily. Um, some of those who have better have more finan financial means have uh, developed pods of mm -hmm. learning. So, so kids in a certain group are able to be together several days a week and, and they've all been cleared amongst them. So they've, they're building their own little isolated communities where they're, the parents are doing the teaching. Mm -hmm. and, um, but they're sharing the, the, the duties between parents. Um, so those children are getting a little more social interaction. And then you've got those without financial means that are, they're stuck at home or wherever. Yeah. Uh, some, and, and of course, employment is kind of scattered. There's yeah. a lot going on right now. I, I don't yeah. know. We'll wait to see after the elections what happens. But um, well, the states will be in our prayers if through for you. all of this. Uh, and, and part, yeah. Yes, Roger. Our, our daughter just bought a house around the corner from us. Oh. And we have to babysit their new little uh, hound that they got, but they have to do things at 1.30. Oh. So <laughs> oh, fun. oh, you got to go. I have a yeah. grand I have a grand dog now. <laughs> okay. hey, lucky you. Lucky you. <laughs> How lucky. My hands are are all bitten from that little week. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll let you go off to your duties then, Roger. Thank you so much for your message. We loved having you here yes. with us. Well, thank you very much. And I always look forward to being with everybody every Sunday. <laughs> Bye -bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Mareva, one of the things that I so appreciated about your message is this, um, uh, not, not just even anecdotally, but actually studies that are showing you know, one of the things that we, I think, are aware of, when we are in this kind of crisis, there's two different outcomes, potentially. And one, when we are divided into our own individual selves, and, and, and therefore we are shattered. And then the other possible response, when we have this powerful community reaction, uh, and that actually strengthens us. Uh, and so I very much appreciated that very uplifting message. Um, and I also just want to thank you and also Puna about from and everyone who joins us from French Polynesia. Uh, when we look at our numbers every week, it's 
French Polynesia is is the third number three country, you know, who of people watching, you know, with beating everybody else by a lot. I'm sorry to say, um, Ava. <laughs> so you know, it's it's definitely United States, Canada, French Polynesia. Oh, you're muted, Mareva. Thank you. <laughs> it, it's um, it's a great pleasure for everyone here. When I hear their testimony, they are always blessed. And so thank you for your our ministry because it goes beyond no borders like uh, <laughs> without walls. Yes. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. I was going to ask uh, Leandro if there are questions from our audience or and or also if you were going to engage uh, Una because of my horrible monolingualism. Ah, <laughs> so. we... Ça va, Puna? You're muted. Oui, ça va très bien. Oui, merci que... pour euh, l'invitation. Non, merci. Merci à vous. Euh... Est-ce que Rono est, est là avec vous? Ah, il est sorti. C'est ah, euh, bon. notre diacre. Oh, merci, euh, merci. De... Tu vois, Rono? Appelle-le. Ouais, il va venir, il vient. Ok. Euh, oui, je remercie Rono, c'est mon technicien. Et parce que Rono est là, j'ai pu commencer avec vous, j'ai pu participer. Donc, il a dit. Et euh, nous allons commencer. Euh, C'est ici, dans le centre de Tarona, nous avons deux groupes qui viennent euh, à la messe. Donc, il y a un premier groupe qui va bientôt commencer là. Mm -hmm. Et donc, Rono fait partie de ce groupe. Et vers ben, 10 heures, ce sera notre tour. Et je, je voulais juste pour dire que maintenant, c'est recommandé de porter du masque, du masque. Et Rono va venir avec sa visière. Ah, pour dire nous, comment avez-vous euh, rencontré ce ministère? Vous nous rejoignez depuis de longtemps. Comment est-ce que vous nous avez rencontrés? Ah! Euh, ben, c'est pas dans ça. C'est peut-être Dieu qui a voulu que <rire> je vous trouve sur, sur mon, mon téléphone. Ah. <rire> Et tous les matins, avant que je me lève du lit, ben, je, je lis. Je vous suis sur le like téléphone like et, et ça me fait du bien parce que si euh, dans ce dimanche-là, j'ai à donner un message, ben j'ai déjà un, un message tout prêt que j'ai entendu le matin avec vous. Alors je partage avec euh, ma congrégation. Voilà les bénédictions que j'ai reçues de de votre congrégation, de, comment ça s'appelle, de Toronto. Toronto. Merci. <rire> merci, merci beaucoup, Pouna. Merci beaucoup de ma réalité. Alors, aïe. Avec sa visière. Ah, merci. Yeah. <rire> I, unfortunately, I, I have a few questions for, for Roger, but Roger has, has left us, so we're going to have to ask Roger uh, next time. Uh, Shelly is asking how often we include participants from around the world, and I would say John, uh, Mary Jean, Parker, it's, it's probably every Sunday, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, we, we have sometimes done a, a, a thing where we have tried to um, like make a special focus of a, a, a francophone service or a, a um, Spanish-speaking service. But in some cases, we just have the mixed, you know, languages, and so like we did this time, and so this has been really quite wonderful. Uh, sometimes we're it's all in English, but some of the people are speaking English from all around the world. <laughs> so. I have uh, also, um, I have you know it's, it's it's already getting to be a little bit late, and I know some of you uh, are probably um, <laughs> eager to join the next worship service. Uh, but I would like to uh, just mention that we received your uh, prayer requests 
and I'm just going to mention that. I'm not, I'm not going to publish uh, anyone's names, but I'm just going to ask everyone to keep in your thoughts and prayer uh, the people of Beirut, the people of Seattle, all those who are uh, undergoing surgery, those who suffered the loss of a dear one recently, those battling uh, the, the coronavirus, um, those uh, battling cancer these days, uh, those who are in their last stages of life. Also, let us keep in our prayers the teachers and the students who are going back to school. Let us also keep in our prayers those who are experiencing uncertainty with their jobs, and as well as those congregations uh, that are in the process of discernment about what's going to happen in the future. And that's all I have for today. Thank you so much. All right, all right and I'll just remind everybody that uh, whereas, although we're not having lectures and meditations, okay. there will be a Sunday service. It, it will simply be um, broadcast, but it is a recorded service. And so it won't be a rerun, but in other words, it's not just the one you've already had, but it'll be a new thing pieced together. Uh, but we won't be doing it live. But I have, I, f I forgot, I forgot something. Okay. Uh, Parker says, it was crazy. The Arctic will be there when the travel restrictions are over. I wonder <laughs> what that could be. Maybe I need to do uh, sound checks. So yeah, let's uh, Zoom. Who knows what, what happens with Zoom. I also have a message from, from our chaplain, Daryl, today. He, was, he says, I have good news and bad news for everyone. Good news. I have appreciated the pleasure of being with each of you this day. The bad news for everyone. I wish each of us could give one another a hug for their sharing today. So hugs for everyone and <laughs> see you next time. Thank you so Bye -bye. much. Thank you so much.